and welcome to Africa Today. I am Esther Mopariola. From contending with social bias to dealing with patriarchal perceptions, Africa is largely seen as a region where it is difficult to thrive and survive as a woman more than anything else. At a time when it is believed that more men are lacking in quality, with more women demanding equality, gender-based violence has been taking pandemic proportions, making it one of the most pervasive violations around the world. And so we ask, what are your thoughts on the ongoing international campaign to challenge the trend of violence against women? You can join the conversation and share your thoughts with us on Twitter at TVC News NG. Well, here is a report and Africa Today will be right back. Welcome. Fatima Bankole is a survivor of an abusive marriage. My husband used to beat me. They beat me from time to time. He was even the one that gave me this mark. You understand? It's 21 stitches. When you get to the matter of death or life, so I have to speak up. The 39 year old mother of four is the first wife in a polygamous home. We are three. So I happen to be the first wife. So we are to share the cooking between the period, 10, 10 days. But that particular year, the second wife is not around. So we are two at home then. So the husband called me that the small wife reported, him, reported me to him that I took the largest fish in the pot. So when I, when, I, when I was trying to explain to him that we do, eat, we do eat together at the dining table last night now, and that, that was when he got angry and he started beating me. Fatima's husband died before the court could give the final judgment. The deputy governor of Lagos State gave her views on violence against women. The citizens must connect and champion the campaign to condemn in strong terms violence and flagrant abuse of women in our homes, workplaces, religious institutions, communities, and in any place whatsoever. For each and every one of us today, we've become an ambassador. We should speak. All those who are us must be held responsible. Education is very, very important. And we must all strive hard in ensuring that our girl child is educated. The convention seeking the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women by the United Nations was instituted in 1979. Also, women activists worldwide observed November the 25th in honor of the three Mirabel sisters murdered in Dominican Republic in 1960. Despite this yearly awareness, violence against women and girls remains a pervasive problem worldwide. Right, before we get into the discussion of the day, let's update you on the top stories around Africa. The Gabonese government has broadcast images of its ailing head of state, President Ali Bongo, in his second public appearance since he was admitted at a hospital in Saudi Arabia in October. Angolan president has met longtime critics of the government, generating some goodwill from activists who struggled to have their voices heard during the long rule of former leader Jose Eduardo dos Santos. And Rwandan opposition leader who awaits judgment on charges of inciting insurrection and forgery after challenging the longtime president in last election says no amount of pressure will silence her. Now joining me to look at the ongoing international campaign to challenge the trend of violence against women is Dr. Ama Oyerima, founder like Live Abundantly Empowerment Initiative. Good to have you here Thank on you the program tonight. Me. Now, we saw this report just a while ago from our, what we're talking about now, a woman being beaten by her husband for one reason or the other. Right. But one begins to ask, why do we have cases where men beat up their wives after they've professed love in, or professed to love the woman during the first year of marriage or so? Well, 
You know, we have to define violence beyond just domestic violence, to be honest with you. Because when we talk about gender violence, gender-based violence, excuse me, we're looking at all forms of violence. And that's what we, the activism is about this time around. Mm. So we're talking about rape, we're talking about incest, we're talking about trafficking, we're talking about domestic abuse, we're talking about all of those various factors that come under violence. Why does a man beat his wife that he professes to um, to love, love in all seasons? In all seasons. Mm. It has to sometimes deal with culture, religion, um, what he's used to seeing from his own family. In other words, if you grew up in a household where your father was beating your mom, you would think that is normal behavior. At the same time, um, society has not really opened up the doors for women to speak about the level of violence that they experience. Part of it is the shame factor. Women are ashamed to admit that they're being violated in their own homes. Nobody wants to hear it. And when you speak about it with families, they tell you it's a family matter between husband and wife. And then, of course, it becomes the, the, the larger extended family gets involved in it. But the reality is that if they understand that they have rights, and that they can go to the authorities and report it, and that they will be supported by their families and their community, they're more likely to break that um, episode of violence within their home so it does not transfer to their children. Right. Um, so does a man love a woman that he's beating? He will tell you, yes, he does. But he probably does not know psychologically that it is wrong to beat your wife. But if you read some of the, the holy books, they tell you that you can um, caution your wife. Really? Um, By yes. how? Oh, well, you can um, tell her that when she's out of order that she's out of order and to correct her. Yes, there's some areas where they say you can correct your wife and it's acceptable, but it is not acceptable because that's a human being who is equal to you, should be equal to you, and is there for more than just sexual pleasure or preparing your meals or birthing your children. Mm. Women should be respected, and women should know that when they're not respected, they can speak up. And it goes back both ways. On one hand, you have families where the children, the girls are not respected. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a home where you're not being respected, you don't know any differently, do you? Absolutely not. Right. But if you're a man and you've grown up in a home where your mother stays, even though she's been violated by your father, then you are going to perpetrate the same thing. Mm. But you have to break it. Mm. And that is really very important. And talking about men beating their wives there are also cases where women beat their husbands even to the point of death you know we had a case where a lawyer sometime last year stabbed her husband and she was sentenced to seven years and another, another woman killed her husband who happens to be a son of a top politician in Abuja so what do you say the same reasons attached to why men beat their wives is applicable to why women also kill or stab their husbands many of the women who beat their husbands up or um you know, end their lives, will tell you that they, they lost it. They just lost it. They went mental for a moment. Psychologically, they probably have been dealing with a lot of violence themselves and just could not figure out how to get out of it. And so in that moment of rage, they fought back. Um, the number of women who violate their husbands is much less. We don't have any data in Nigeria. It's very little data. We're only just hearing about those kinds of things. But in the past, it's been very silent. So are you saying women who beat their husbands are more of resentment, built-in resentment over to the years? To some extent, yes. To some extent, yes. Hmm. It's the resentment, it's the anger, it's the fear that you're going to be killed, so I have to retaliate. Um, unless, of course, they've been exposed to that in their own homes, and so they bring it forth. But it's, it's more prevalent to, for men to uh, violate the women than for the women to violate the men. Mm. But I am one who knows that there are men being violated and they sit in silence. I, as a matter of fact, the level of silence of men being violated is actually worse than women because you can't imagine a macho man telling his friends or going to the police to report that his wife is just you know, beating him up, him. assaulted him, mm. you know, they're going to laugh at him, most mm. likely. But even women who go and report that they've been assaulted are not always believed, right? Mm. So it's a double-edged sword. However you're being violated, you have a right to report it. And it's not acceptable behavior. Mm. And you shouldn't be stigmatized because you've been violated, right? And so we have to figure out how do we help people understand through advocacy, through um, awareness campaigns, through education, that abuse of any sort 
whether it is male, female, female, male, is unacceptable and it's not part of what we should be doing in, in society. In society today. Now, talking about reporting cases where one is being violated, be it the man or a woman, you rightly put it, no, you, you have to speak out. You yes. cannot bottle everything into your heart or into your you know, soul like that. Definitely, it will definitely bring out something you know, not pleasant at all. Right. But for those who need to report, who do they report to? Is it the police? Is it the church? Because that's usually the case. Or is it to the parents? Because you now actually mentioned that even families tell you you don't say such things. If it happens, you go back to your homes and you know you bury it there. So right. who or what is the appropriate channel where these cases can be reported to? The police. The police. You have to report to the police. They are the legal body within the government, within the country, assigned with the protection of people and property. So you have to report. They have a gender unit. You go there and you report it. And they will take action. I have a situation yesterday where a young girl who had attended one of our programs um, learned about human rights. And her mother apparently has been violated numerous times. Except this time it was the uncle, husband's brother, who had beaten her up. And the girl now tells her mom, you do have rights and you can report it. So at 10 o'clock last night, I received a call from a girl who had attended, well, the mother telephoned because the daughter had given her a pamphlet from our event. And so she said, my daughter says I have rights and I should speak up and I'm going to speak up. Well, that leads to us helping her understand what the next steps are. And in our case, we were able to place a few calls to the DPO to say, this is the situation that's going on. Um, can you please assist this woman? She's petrified. She thinks they're going to laugh at her. She thinks no one is going to believe that she's being violated, not just by her husband, mm. but now by the brother as well. Mm. So we, you have to go to the police. You have to file police reports. Secondly, when these cases are filed, there has to be prosecution. We have to take it seriously. There's a level of impunity where we hear about these cases and guess what you don't hear about the outcomes mm -hmm. so we need to make sure that we follow up with the cases when they're reported we need to take them seriously we need to desensitize ourselves so that we have empathy and compassion for those who are being violated and we need to stop shaming them and stigmatizing them mm -hmm. it's very important because if you're violated whether you're raped or you're beaten people don't want to associate with you you become a social pariah. And talking about you know reporting this case to, to the police, there are cases where the police also often is caught to be compromising in these situations. For instance, maybe a woman or lady is being assaulted or being raped, as it were, and the police says, well, perhaps they have, they have no case to give you. You have no case in this matter. How? What next for the victim? You continue to report it, and you go further up the chain until you get somebody who listens to you. You go to advocacy groups and you tell them what's going on. Mm. The truth of the matter is we're having more um, awareness of these kinds of things because for so long we didn't talk about them. We kept it in the homes. And even when they report it, sometimes the families will go back and remind them, that is your breadwinner. You can't have your breadwinner being locked up by the police and being prosecuted. So guess what? They leave it and say, we can't do anything. But I think it needs to go into the, in this matter, mm. it needs to be the law enforcement and the judiciary enforcing that there is punitive action taken against those who violate women and children. Mm. And then before we go into a second segment now, let's look at the violent relationships now itself. How can one trace you know, such behaviors before one finally locks he or self up as a marriage partner, for instance, for a long time? Pay attention to the signals because they're usually there. If a man is controlling you whilst you're dating and telling you what to wear, what not to do, where to sit, what to eat, where to go, want to know about your finances, is already planning your life for you, or you feel threatened and anxious when you're around them, there's something going on there. You have to pay attention. Mm. Listen to what people are telling you because you can't live in society and people not know what's going on, mm. right? So pay attention. Don't think you're going to change a person because you can't change anyone. Right. People have to change themselves, right. but you have to be aware of who you're marrying. All right, let's quickly go on a quick break. When we return, we'll progress further into the level of women empowerment in our society and how we can change the narrative. Stay with us. Access to funding and societal discrimination are some challenges facing Nigerian women in business. Though the Nigerian authorities have several programs targeted at women in business, 
many of them still grapple with business growth challenges. The National Council on Women's Societies is now working with development support organizations to link indigenous female manufacturers with the international market. It's not always that we want to be importing things. We also want to export things. And I'm sure that we have lots and lots of goods to export, especially in Aba. To galvanize international funding for women entrepreneurs, to create market access where Nigerian business women can have the opportunity to showcase what they can do and also to understand what it takes to do business internationally. The Women Development Summit is to help in capacity building, attract foreign investment and create a networking platform for yeah. Nigerian women and the international business community. How women can have the right business etiquette. We are talking about leadership here. We are talking about how you can secure yourself, your family members and then your business as well so that we can see um, how we can synergize with the outside world. Business communities, investors, business people will meet with our entrepreneurs and I bet you that will give an opening, tremendous opening for Nigeria. And when we talk about sustainable development, we want to see how we can create an avenue for women to key in and do great things. I mean, we want to know how women can do businesses in the, from their homes and export. The National Council of Women's Societies also wants those vying for political offices to be focused on the economic empowerment of women in their manifestos. Welcome back. The 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, which runs from November the 25th to December the 10th, is designed to galvanize action to end violence against women and girls around the world. But for far too long, impunity, exclusion and discrimination has allowed violence against women to fester at a point that one in three women around the world have been victims. Well, before we get into the issue of women empowerment now, let's still look at what this um, violence does to children. I'm talking about psychological effects. Right. When a child sees a man, uh, he sees his father beat his mother and vice versa, what psychological effects does this pretend to the young ones? Well, it diminishes your capacity to understand that you are a whole human being and you should be respected. If a girl sees the mother being um, disrespected, being beaten in any form, then she begins to see herself diminish in the eyes of society. And the message is, you're not important, you're not valuable, and you don't have a say. And mm. I can control you physically, emotionally, and psychologically. Um, what happens is you have girls who don't have good self-confidence, self-esteem. It affects their studies. Um, you sometimes will have children who sort of um, going to bedwetting if they're young. It affects their homework, their studying, and they begin to lose interest sometimes in the social things that are appropriate for the age group. Mm. Some children, like the one I just described, is actually busy taking care of mom. I'm looking out for my mommy now because I want to make sure that mommy is fine. A child shouldn't be doing that. A child should be a child. At the same time, when, child, when children are violated, they need parents who are going to listen to them and listen to what they have to say mm -hmm. and believe them when they say they're being violated, mm -hmm. whether it's by a family member or a complete stranger. So how do we put an end to violence, domestic violence, if we're to talk about every time, every year, we'll, we'll keep commemorating you know, International Day against the violence against, gender, against women, how can we put a stop this, to this? It starts with awareness and education. It's very important that we do things such as this and others to educate society and the community on what is going on. We have rights and those rights should not be violated, one. Two, we have to go out and make sure that we educate children from a very young age to respect one another. One another excuse mm, me. Yeah. When you respect the person in your classroom and recognize that they're equal, they're your equals yes. and they're going to learn just like you and they have equal opportunities, mm -hmm. you're less likely to go on to abuse or violate another human being. Right. We also have to make sure that the campaign of advocacy is heightened. And if we do that, then we must ensure that when it is reported, action is taken. You can have all the laws in the land, but if you don't prosecute, if you don't hold people accountable for their actions, 
still goes back in circles. It goes back in circles. All right, let's quickly look into the issue of the women empowerment now. How would you assess the level of women involvement in social economic development? Um, is a, an area that further development is needed. It is not the same. Um, the, based on how you enter the socioeconomic strata mm. determines how you can access it and make good use of it. But it goes back to educating our girls. When we educate our girls, our girls are going to become women. Right. And educated girls become women who are able to feed into the system and be part of the development of the nation. And it starts with the community. A girl that's educated would take care of herself and her family, take care of the community because she has an interest in her community, mm. and that grows into the larger society. Mm -hmm. So educating the girls is very important. Now, if a girl, if a woman has not had any kind of education, then we need to start thinking about some non-formal, informal forms of education, whether it's going to vocational and technical schools, whether it's learning apprenticeship, whether it's skills, based learning, mm -hmm. it's all very important because at the end of the day, women are truly important to the development of the country, right. one, but women at the grassroots are the ones taking care of their families. Mm. Now, even as much as we know all these things, there's, there is something that you know holds us back despite these ventures, which opens a, uh, promises better opportunities. Because if you find, if you see, so in some cases, some women say they, they cannot, they don't have the strength or they don't have the stamina to take one or two positions in economic, in, in a, in economic growth, for instance. They would say, oh, my family, I have my children to take care of, I have my husband to not to look after. So, what apart from all this, what else holds us back? Do you think we are ready to take the to take the front seat as change drivers, as change, you know, yeah, change drivers. The change that occurs in communities usually come from the women. Hmm because it's the women who want more for themselves, for their families, and for their community. So at the grassroots level, yes, the women push, but we need to do it on a grander scale so that women are pushing the agenda, women are part of the social fiber, women are part of politics, women are part of the government, and they need to advance and be encouraged to do more for themselves. Yes, you can take care of your children and come back to work, it's acceptable. Many women do that, but for those women who have selected or decided they want to follow a career path, to encourage them to be promoted, to be to do further education, it's very critical. Mm. Now let's look at this issue where women who are disabled do not have the chance to express themselves because they say who an, woman who is a, you know a, twice a, 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 a woman who is disabled is twice you know denied the opportunities of other women as well. So how can these women in our society who find themselves in this? Um, situation mm -hmm. be able to reach out be able to make a mark and not be left you know kept into a corner like they are not able to do anything at all so we're talking about an inclusive society right. um, to have an inclusive society you have to embrace difference that we're all different even all of us who are able-bodied and can use our five all our senses have some sort of um, physiological thing that we deal with it may not be to the magnitude of somebody who is disabled or who has a, dis a disability, but the fact is it has to be an inclusive society, and that starts with children. The children who are physiologically challenged must be accepted in society. You can't hide them. They should go to school. They should be educated, because if you start at the young age to include them in what is going on, if you let them understand that just because you have this challenge does not mean you cannot participate in society, you'll get more of them participating and going on and living much richer lives. When you find a 10-year-old in kindergarten because the parents don't know that there are schools for hearing impairment, right. there are schools for those who are visually impaired, it means that we have not done our homework as a society to include them and to educate parents who have those children that they can be part of society and they'll be accepted. Now we make sure that they have the training and if they have been neglected and they're now adults, then let's do more of the um, skills-based training so that they can be inclusive and mm. included in the society. Well, final thoughts now on this issue regarding women. How do we end up celebrating ourselves as change drivers and not being seen as weak vessels? We have to make sure that we take a stand, that we're heard for what we have to say and what we do. And we recognize that when someone violates us, that we can speak about it. But if we're going to be change makers, we have to speak about it and we have to take action. 
All right, and that's a fine place to leave it right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Ama Onyerima, founder, Live Abundantly Empowerment Initiative. It's a pleasure to have your insights on Africa Today tonight. Thank you for having me. Well, in a continent where the relationship between the policies to empower the legislation to prosecute and the advocacy to end violence against women remains complex, history has shown that the law alone can't change social behavior. So, collective actions must override existing rhetorics to reverse the negative trends, knowing that Africa's hope towards becoming a better place lies in how women are treated. And that is our package for tonight. But don't forget to join the conversation as usual on Twitter at TVC News NG. And also follow me for updates around Africa at Esther TVC News. Until the next one again, I am Esther Omokwariola. And always remember, Africa can only get better.